Julia? So, um, for those of you who don't know how the Special Needs Scholarship got to where it is today, um, it started out as a tax credit bill and it had bipartisan support. And the idea was that we needed to really take a look at some parents who had come to us, and this was a parent-driven bill. So parents came to organizations like the ARC in North Carolina, the Autism Society of North Carolina, and other disability advocacy groups and asked us to assist them in moving forward something that would allow them to take their child from the public school system and put them into a private school and receive some funding to support that private school. When we got started, we realized that it was more than just private school options that were required. We really needed to look at how could we do homeschooling and support parents who wanted to homeschool their child with disabilities. How could we craft a bill and craft a program that would really address children with the most significant disabilities in our state? Um, and so to qualify for the program, you need an IEP or you need to be qualified to receive an IEP, which is an individual education plan in the state of North Carolina. It's federally uh, recognized under the IDEA laws. And that allowed us to really target students who um, often are in classrooms where they may not be able to receive all the support services, especially when you look outside your metropolitan area. When you're looking at your rural, your far rural west, your far rural east, where maybe they, ha they have all best intentions, but they need more support and they can't get it. I think one of the strengths has been, as that moved from a tax credit program into a scholarship program, what we saw was really good education across the board with legislative support on how this was integral to special education. Um, I also think one of the strengths of the program has been that as we've continued on, we've made really good tweaks to it. For example, um, you no longer have to have a full-fledged IEP meeting, which takes a lot of time and effort from the public school system. You just have to go through the process to qualify. Um, we also um, have other people now who can do educational reauthorization for the parents as opposed to going back to the public school and having to use their resources. I think one of the weaknesses, honestly, is the funding. Every single year, one of us has to fight to get more money to address growing wait lists. We have about 500 students on the wait list for this program. And that is a concern. I think the other weakness is when you look at the overall needs of a child with a disability, 4,000 per semester probably is not enough. And it's not enough in many ways, because what I've seen a lot of parents do with this program is they may be able to pay part of the tuition themselves, and then they split this scholarship to provide other academic supports or other social supports or speech therapy or occupational therapy or, or some type of ABA therapy if your child has autism. I do think we have an excellent opportunity, and I would be really remiss to not say it today, um, since today is the rollout day, but as of today, North Carolina has opened up their ABLE Act program. So as of today, our state is now ABLE ready, as we say. So parents now have this other option. For those of you not familiar with ABLE, it's a 529A savings account. Um, you can put funding in it for your child with a disability without affecting any of their Medicaid services or their Social Security disability services. But it can be used for educational opportunities as well. So I think this is an opportunity to really start educating our legislators um, on the need to expand that scholarship and to move that, that bracket up financially uh, for the, from, from 4000 4, a semester, but also how would this help parents if we co-educate or intersectionally educate on how to also use the ABLE Act accounts that became available to our, our state today. Thank you.